grand and uh, you want to um, be encouraged. Read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, <laughs> the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Interesting that it would be Jacob that he mentions, isn't it? Remember Jacob? His experience was he, he was fighting with God, remember? It's not a bad thing to fight with God because God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, which means he fought with God and prevailed. That's the name of God's people. So if you're struggling with God, be encouraged. God calls his people that, struggling and prevailing. Just keep struggling with him because he loves you. Let's see how this goes. I don't need that yet. I'm a, since becoming a gardener uh, at home and at work, in the, uh, uh, that was a year ago now, I uh, have got a new appreciation for our Creator. And, uh, you know, we just disturb the soil a bit. We push things in there like seeds and plants and out comes food. It's absolutely amazing thousands of kilograms of food and it blesses a lot of families that was the food I was going to show you that came out of my garden and um, those are the best tomatoes in the district <laughs> they're beautiful Go all good creators like to put their hallmark you know their signature on their creations don't they artists sign their paintings they always place their signature or their seal on them in the beginning the bible says god created the heavens and the earth and uh, what could he do to put his signature on it to indicate its origin its purity and its genuineness. What would he do? You know, we don't, Seventh day Adventists don't keep Saturday just to be different. <laughs> we keep it because God made a day as a signature of his creation. He, you know, how could he, how, could, how would you memorialize something that you'd done? Would you put up a monument? The world is full of monuments. Look at that. Bahrain, Algeria. That's about car racing. This is my, one of my favorites, probably my favorite monument in the world. Have you seen it? This is in South Africa place called Howick and I'm looking at it, at it from a funny angle but it was a special piece done let me read as you approach it you, you see it like this this impressive sculpture by artist Marco Cianfinelli consists of 50 steel poles between 8 and 10 meters tall arranged in a pattern that allows the viewer a flat image of the face of Nelson Mandela facing west 
when approached from the footpath leading down towards it. Exactly 35 metres away. From that position, the laser-cut mild steel poles line up to create the illusion of a perfectly flat image. The 50 steel columns represent the 50 years since his capture. They also portray the idea of making a hole. And, you know, you can see the bars. It's an amazing piece. It's where he was captured. It's, they put it up where he's... And there's no real signage. It's just there. And you have to stand in one particular spot to see the image. It's quite amazing. This gives you an idea of the size of it. But you know, monuments can be destroyed by vandals, can't they? Monuments are hard to get to if they're on the other side of the world. So God created a day, a piece of time, so he could remind us about his sovereignty. Time is the best gift you can give your children, they say, isn't it? Time is also the best way to have a memorial we have Waitangi Day we have Anzac Day we have Americans have Thanksgiving Day when we stop work and we contemplate and we remember and we celebrate respect is shown by stopping to remember and when you think about it, it might be offensive not to, right? I wonder what the Anzacs think if we don't stop work on Anzac Day. So, God created the Sabbath. Right back in Genesis 2, if you want to have a look. Genesis 2, you remember the first verses of that chapter? I got my pictures up, it's died now. Genesis 2, the first verses say, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The Sabbath wasn't an afterthought. God created it in the first week of human history as part of the order, isn't it? You see that? He created order in the world. This is how the world will function. And he put the Sabbath right in there so that the world wouldn't forget him as creator. There's lots of aspects to the symbol of the Sabbath. Memorial, remembering, deliverance. He said in Deuteronomy 5.15, Keep the Sabbath because I brought you out of Egypt when you were slaves. In Leviticus 23.3, he says, The Sabbath is a holy convocation. What does that mean? A sacred assembly, it says in the other versions. Is a, there's the idea of rest, stopping work, and remember how they... In Exodus 16, before they got to Mount Sinai, they had to get extra on Friday, extra manna from the ground on Friday because there wasn't going to be any on Sabbath morning. So they had to rest from their work. And it says in uh, chapter 23, 12, even, no, in 34, 21, it says, even in plowing time and harvest time, you have to keep the Sabbath. You know, I can tell you we're busy, busy, busy at work. Now's the time for planting, plowing. That's what I do most days. And the weather's beautiful. We should be in a tractor, right? Growing lots of things because every day counts. But no. God said, even in the plowing time and the harvest time, remember the Sabbath. In the... Uh, Exodus 23, 12, he says, your, so that your animals and your workers can have a rest too. So he's trying to bless everyone, isn't he? There's the idea in the Sabbath of sanctification, making us holy. 
making us like him, you know, creating in us a character like God, character development, Christ-likeness. And the idea is stop trying to work your way to heaven and rest in what he's done. Jesus lived a perfect life without sin and he's offering it to you free. You can have his life in place of yours. What an amazing gospel. Jesus says, stop trying to work your way to heaven. You know, Alan White makes an amazing statement. Um, we can never earn eternal life because it's eternal and we're not. <laughs> right? It's infinite. The gift of salvation is infinite. And we're not infinite we're just finite beings so no matter what we did we can never earn it so there's this amazing idea in the sabbath of rest from trying to work your way to please god jesus has already pleased god and he's offering it to you his goodness his righteousness to you by faith credited to you we learned in our lesson didn't we you can rest there's also the promise in Isaiah 66 that the Sabbath that began in Eden will be continuing in the new earth. So, you know, we're just keeping the faith till we get to the new earth and the Sabbath will continue. It's, the, it's a sign, he said, between his people and him. And a sign is like a signature, isn't it? God has an enemy. And Daniel had a dream, remember? In chapter 7 of Daniel. This enemy objects to people worshipping God as creator. That's what I've never talked about. A holy convocation is the idea of getting together, isn't it? <coughs> a sacred assembly where we can get together and worship God as creator. But Daniel predicted in chapter 7, you know, the dream he had of four great beasts. One was a lion, one was a bear, one was a leopard, and one was so terrible he couldn't even really describe it very well. It was so terrible and scary, frightening, powerful, iron teeth. It crushed its and devoured its victims. <coughs> and then he gives an explanation. Genu uh, chapter 7 of verse 23. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. All of these great beasts were political powers that were going to rule the earth. Is a fourth beast which will, which was, sorry. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three things, three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. Satan doesn't want us keeping the Sabbath because the Sabbath demonstrates to the world that there's a creator who is worthy of worship. So, <laughs> way back there was predicted, and yes, it happened. And he used the powerful, you know, all-dominating church that ruled the world at the time and uh, brought in this idea at another day. Another day. Let's worship on another day. You can't destroy... A monument like time, can you? Because you, wherever you are in the world, you can go there. You can't vandalize it, but you can replace it. And that's what he does, you see. Antichrist, as it means, in place of. So he gives another day to try and stop the idea of creator worship. And have you noticed that the world has stopped believing that there's a creator? 
I did have a statement on here. I'll see if it'll go again. No, definitely not. <laughs> I had a statement from the Council of Trent, which is a pretty amazing statement about how the from Archbishop Reggio, if you're writing it down, have a look. Look it up on the internet. Reggio, R-E-G-G-I-O. He came to the Council of Trent and, and made this statement about how Protestants actually are just like the Catholic Church. They believe that tradition goes along with the Bible. Their faith is not just the Bible. It must be tradition because... If they keep Sunday, the Bible teaches the seventh day. So if they keep Sunday, then they're relying on tradition. So that's a quite a powerful statement. You'll also find that in that little book, um, Rome's Challenge. Rome has challenged the Protestant world to uh, be truthful and, and, uh, and, and keep the Sabbath. We have uh, this week actually, Armistice Day. When's Armistice Day, do you know? Did you say the 11th? The, see, peop some people know they were there <laughs> at the time. It's the end of the First War. And, uh, well, they certainly heard about it um, in their younger years. The end of the First World War was Armistice Day, and it was at the 11th hour. On the 11th day of the 11th month, all the guns stopped. So this week, uh, Tuesday is it, they'll be stopping at 11 o'clock in the morning to remember. Commemorated this week. What happened on April the 25th? You guys know, I can see you whispering it. Anzac Day, isn't it? Why do we remember Anzac Day? Well, 2,779 young Kiwis died in the First World War in a crazy uh, attempt to storm a beach in Turkey. And uh, in Gallipoli, wasn't it? Now... That's an important date in New Zealand, and if you ever go to Anzac morning, you'll see it's getting bigger and bigger every year. People are kind of longing for <laughs> opportunities to remember, and uh, Anzac Day seems to be the thing. Why not April the 26th? You know, I asked the RSA that once. Would it be okay if I celebrated Anzac Day on April the 26th? And the guy said, that would be meaningless. What would it be a memorial of? N November the 10th. What's special about that day? Mrs. Wallace? It's my parents' wedding anniversary, but it's also ours. So that's Monday, isn't it? 25 years this Monday. Now, if I just ignore it and pretend it didn't happen, what sort of message does that send to my wife? <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? We got a card from her mum saying, just thinking of you on the 3rd. She forgot the date. I'm not sure if she ever knew the date, but I really appreciated her sending us a card for our anniversary. But she got the date wrong. But there's another thing that might happen. We might both be working all day in into the night. And if we do not go and celebrate, she'll understand because she knows me well. And uh, we've got 25 years of history that shows the relationship. We know each other. I'm just thinking of you people who feel bad when you can't make it to church. <laughs> God knows you. He knows your heart. And we feel guilty and stuff, don't we? But if the relationship's strong, then 
course it helps to commemorate, but if you can't. And some people would love to kneel to pray, but you can't eventually, right? God knows your heart. But the other, doing it on another day makes it meaningless. So this is what I say to um, friends who, who argue with me about the Sabbath. Uh, honour is always given in the terms, on the terms of the person being honoured. Do you agree? Not on the person giving honour. Honour is always given on the terms of the person being honoured, right? So if you go to see the Queen, she tells you the protocol, she tells you how to dress even, and what you will do when you come into her presence. And so, you know, when God says the seventh day is the Sabbath, and we come along and say, well, that's a bit inconvenient. This other day, will this be okay? Is that the ultimate in works? My own works in place of his? In fact, Sunday is the only day that couldn't be the Sabbath. God could have created the world in three days and rested on the fourth. He could have made the world even in one day and rested on the second, but he couldn't have made the world and rested on the first day of the week, right? Isn't Satan blatant? He doesn't just make a little point. He has gone all out to say, I want to be worshipped in God's place. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, for man's benefit. Time off work to be still and know that I am God. And we asked the question this morning in our lesson, why? Why does God say Saturday? Well, what was the answer? I don't know why. There's no reason, there's no rational reason. But you remember the story George Vanderman used to tell about the farmer who had a son. And the farmer was going away for most of the season and he said to his boy, I want you to, he laid, went and took him around the farm and he showed him each field and he said, I want you to grow the pumpkins here, the potatoes here, the peanuts here, and the other things, you know, the corn. And so his dad, and then he went away, you see. And uh, the boy said, great, I'm in the boss now. So he got his soil tester gear out and he went into each field and checked the soil. Yeah, that's great for pumpkins. Check the next one, yep. That's great for uh, peanuts. He went over to this one. That soil is completely wrong for corn. I'm going to grow sweet potatoes. So he did. The father came back six months later and all the crops were growing. He said, look, Dad, how did I do? And his father went out and had a look and he said, you never did anything I told you. Is he right? You never obeyed me at all. He was right because the boy knew better, didn't he? So, you know, when we come along to God and say, I know you said this, but I want to do it like this. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Faith without works, isn't it? In the lesson this morning. God, the Creator, deserves worship. Lucifer or Satan, the creature, wants worship, and we choose who we worship. We choose how we live. We choose how we live, and our li our lives demonstrate who we worship. I had a picture I was going to show you, and it's quite a shocking picture. I don't know if you... Have, think about a skull or a skeleton. You know, we, when we see one, we're kind of 
draw, draw away, don't we? It's kind of scary. And did you realise you all look like that? Underneath? What is it that scares us about it? Well, it hasn't got flesh, you know. And I think this is what went wrong. It was just an idea I got this week. This is what went wrong with Israel, right? They only had this kind of skeleton picture of God. And he scared them. It was the same God, but then the Bible says the Word was made flesh and came and dwelled among us, and then we saw what God was really like. Isn't that interesting? He, Jesus, filled out our picture of God. So he's not scary. So if you get to know him, you will know God. Jesus was crucified for our sins. While we were still sinners, he died for our sins. So he is worthy of worship. And I want to encourage you this morning. If you're not already worshipping the Creator and his Son, you won't regret it. Every artist, every Creator person treasures his creations. I know I do. And... Uh, God treasures you much more than you treasure your creations. He gave his son so that you could have a place with him for eternity. So I want to encourage, encourage you with that. Our last hymn, this is the secret of gaining that blessing. All to Jesus I surrender. It's free but it costs you everything.
pray this prayer again this morning, surrendering everything to you. We come together each Sabbath and uh, enjoy your presence and uh, we recharge, refreshed to go out and bless others each week. We pray truly that your, your Holy Spirit would do his work in us, make us worthy citizens of your kingdom and may others around us want what we have. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.